All right, open with me in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 11 and 12 this morning. Now you remember as we finished our study last week, we looked at this, these verses from verse 5 through verse 10 of this first chapter that referred to the coming judgment of God. There is a judgment that is coming, and Christ is coming to do that judgment. But then, in verse 10, he said that he is also coming in a day to be glorified in his saints. So there's two comings he describes here. One, to those who have rejected him, he's to bring judgment. To those who have accepted him, he is coming to be glorified in them. And now, in verses 11 and 12, what he does here is to pray for something very specific, that you might be ready for that coming, that he would count you worthy of this calling that is upon your life. Read with me verse 12, or verse 11 and 12. He says, therefore, we also pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Why? That the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now many times when people read a text like this that describes being being counted worthy of the calling of God upon their lives, they just begin to quake. They begin to think, oh, how could that ever be? They begin to think to themselves, there is no way possible that I could be counted worthy of receiving this incredible blessing from God. So if that's you this morning, I want you to realize that what he prays about here actually gives you the instruction of how you could be counted worthy of the calling that is upon your life. You see, the Lord calls. Many are called unto him and he wants you to be counted worthy of that calling so how does that take place well notice here in verse 11 he says therefore we also pray always for you now notice that Paul here identifies the issue of prayer and he believed that praying for this church and the people within it, that that was a very important aspect of being counted worthy of this calling upon their lives. He believed that praying for them was absolutely essential. Now, prayer is something that you first need to do for yourself to be counted worthy of the calling of God, and then you need to pray for those in your family. You need to be praying for your spouse. You need to be praying for your children. You need to be praying for your friends and co-workers that they also would be counted worthy of the calling that God has placed upon them. Prayer is absolutely essential. Now, why would he encourage us to pray? Why would he pray? Well, prayer is one of the most fundamental ways that you touch the Lord and that the Lord touches you. This is how you get in connection with Him. This is how you touch the hem of His garment. 
you pray. And when you pray, you will be touched by Him. And there is where you will experience the power to then be counted worthy of this calling that is upon your life. Prayer is essential. Now Jesus said that this was very important for all those that wanted to be counted worthy to escape all of the things that were coming upon the earth. In Luke 21, verse 36, after he speaks about the great judgment that will come in the tribulation period, Notice that this is exactly what Jesus prayed for. This is what he encourages us to do. He says, watch therefore and pray always. Notice that little phrase, pray always. That's exactly what Paul teaches here in our text this morning. He says, I pray always for you. So Jesus said, watch, or in other words, be awake, don't go to sleep, watch, and pray always that you may be counted, what? Worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So Jesus believed that prayer was very important, or else he would not have taught this. So he's encouraging you to pray. Now, do you do this? Have you ever prayed this? I'm telling you, I've prayed this many a time. Lord, every time I read through this chapter in Luke and I come to this, this encouragement, I'm telling you, I stop and I say, Lord, I pray that I will be accounted worthy to escape all of these things and to stand before you. So I hope that you're praying this because it is essential. Now notice the connection between prayer and the judgment of God. That's, that's what Paul does here in our text in, first Thess or in 2 Thessalonians. And it's what Jesus did. Now why would you pray? Well, because you realize you aren't worthy in yourself. That's the only reason why anyone ever prays. Because they realize they don't have what it takes. They don't have the strength to walk their, their walk every day. They realize they don't have the wisdom. They don't have the direction. And so they're asking for it. Do you see your need? Do you see that absolute need that you have before God? If you do, then you will be praying, and you will be praying on a regular basis. You won't be shooting up a little, well, thanks for the food, amen, and never contact him again the rest of the day. That is somebody who is dependent on themselves. You will be talking to him throughout your day because you realize you are not worthy. You do not have the strength. You do not have the power. This is clear from Scripture in Genesis 32, verse 10. Here is Jacob praying. What does he say? I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. Now, what's he saying here? He's saying, I am not worthy, and I know I am not worthy of any of it, of the least of his mercies. And not one of us in this room is worthy of the least, the smallest of his mercies. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, the Apostle Paul said, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. You see, throughout the scripture, you see this from those who wrote the scriptures under the inspiration of the Spirit to reveal this about themselves, that they would be an example to every one of us. So is this what you hear coming out of your lips as you pray? Lord, I am not worthy. Now, if that is 
Where do you find your worthiness? How do you become worthy? Where, what should you pray for? Well, you should be praying for the Lord's only way that you could ever be found worthy. It's the only covering for the sin that so easily besets every single one of us. It is one and only way. Paul declared in Philippians 3.9, after he declares in verse 8 that he wants to win and gain Christ, that that is the number one thing he wants, then he tells us how. He says, I want to gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Now notice here that Paul is very clear about what he believed was going to gain him access into heaven. If you read the very next verse, he speaks about his desire to go to heaven. So the context is very clear. There's one way, there's one thing that he wanted. I want to be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness which is the righteousness that God gives by faith in Christ Jesus. Now in Revelation chapter 3, verse 4, there Jesus said, You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are, what? Worthy. So what gives them that worthiness to walk with him he said they have not defiled their garments. And then he describes these garments as being white. What are these garments that he refers to? Well, he tells us in Revelation 19.8. Here the definition of what these garments are. There again in the context clear, referring to the, to the church. He says, to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen, which is white, is the righteousness or the righteous acts of the saints, depending on your translation. This particular word here, righteous acts or righteousness, it, they, it can be translated either way. The righteousness of Christ is what then enables righteous acts. This particular word can be translated either way because it, they, it means the same. You have righteous acts that you will perform because he has made you righteous. He has given you that fine linen, clean and white, the only covering that is, will enable you to stand in his presence. It's the wedding garment that you must have if you are going to stand before him. And so I'm I'm just encouraging you this morning be in prayer. If you want to be counted worthy, you need to be a man or a woman of prayer. The second aspect of this being counted worthy is in the middle of verse 11. He says that God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. Now if you pray this is what is going to take place. He is going to fulfill in you the good pleasure of His goodness. Now notice that it says here, fulfill in you. It doesn't say fulfill by you. It's fulfilled in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. God fulfills something in you that then comes out of you you will then walk in His goodness. You will walk in a way that is pleasing and bring, bring pleasure to Him. Now this is walking worthy of this calling. Now how does He do this? Well notice in Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. It says, Paul said, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. You see, Paul understood that this was something that God did in you. It's something that he, you cannot produce yourself. You cannot 
become a good person in yourself. It's not within you. It's something that He does inside you. He works in you first the will or the desire to do what is well-pleasing in His sight, and then He gives you the power to do that which is well-pleasing in His sight. He does this by His grace and His grace alone. His good pleasure is that you walk worthy of His calling. He tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling. Here's that phrase again. Then he says, with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. So, what does it mean? What does it look like? to walk worthy of that calling. Well, notice that he defines it here as first an attitude of humility, of lowliness. You see, that is that issue we just addressed in my first point. You won't pray unless you see you don't have it. That's what gives you that lowliness in your heart, that humility, that honesty about yourself. And then that humility is what allows the Lord to do this work inside you. It's what allows Him to work His gentleness, His long-suffering, His love inside of you. And that will produce a life that is well-pleasing to Him. Now, is it, would it be easy to hang out with somebody who is humble, gentle, long-suffering, patient, loving. I mean, I'd like to hang out next to somebody like that because we could have a great relationship. The other end of that, or the opposite of that, is somebody who is prideful, somebody who is harsh and impatient and selfish. That is not a person you're going to have a good relationship with because it's going to create conflict after conflict. It's not going to be something that pleases the Lord. And so if you want to walk worthy of this calling, this attitude is essential. Now this word worthy is something that is very important for us to understand before we, we get too much further in this study. The, the Greek word for worthy is really been lost in translation. It's been lost in translation because it comes from a, an understanding that was only known in the ancient world, where men and women would go into the marketplace and they would take whatever their, their goods were and they would be weighed in the balance. And the weights, if they were worthy weights, would be given a just uh, accounting. And this is the, the concept that is used in this word. The word worthy literally means of the same weight as. And so it's got this idea of a balance. So he's saying, is your profession, does it have the same weight as your walk? Are you walking with the same weight as your profession? Are you called by God and are you living according to that calling? That's the question. So that's what you have to answer this morning. Is your life, does it have the same weight as what you profess? Am I living what I believe? Is there action in accordance with my profession? And so you say, if you say, well, yes, Steve, it is. There is, I see a, a definite correlation between what I believe and how I'm living. It's not what it should be, but it surely is not what it used to be. Well, then I would say, hey, that's a, that's a good answer. That's a good response. Because there's room for growth in every single one of our lives here in this room. 
And so we're never, we will never stop growing and maturing. And he will bring that, that equality and the balance constantly in our lives. So does your walk have the same weight as your words? If it does, then it is proof that you truly have surrendered to him. This is, the word worthy has nothing to do with merit, your personal merit. It has to do with personal surrender. That's all that it refers to. It's speaking of your surrender to him. Now let me give you one last example of how Jesus defined this particular word. In Matthew 10, verses 37 and 38, Jesus speaking about discipleship and following him. He said, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Now notice here this idea. He's saying, if you love your father or mother or wife or children more than me in the balance here, then it doesn't have the same weight. It's not the same. It's not right. It's out of balance. That's what he means by, you're not worthy of me. In other words, he says, I have to be first. Notice that last little sentence, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So he's asking us to die to self. He's saying, if you want to follow me, then you're going to have to take up your cross. You're going to have to die. It's going to cost you something to follow me. And I believe sincerely this cost is going to rise ever more as we proceed closer to the Lord's return. I believe that persecution is coming our way. I can see it. It's already begun. Just look at the last election. I'm telling you, do you realize that the opponents of Proposition 8 have targeted churches, Christian churches? They've targeted the individuals that supported Prop 8 with their money. Through the Freedom of Information Act, they got the list of all the people that donated. And you know that they're targeting individual businesses and people and pastors and churches that supported that organization. It's on the news. I had a friend of mine and he sent me an email this last week and his father donated a, a tremendous amount of money. Well, They've targeted his father and his business and because he has a statewide business and they're targeting his organization as well. It's coming. So get ready. You're either going to speak up and stand up or you're going to hide out and deny him just like Peter did. That's, the, that's what's going to happen. So... Do you love him more and are you willing to take up your cross and follow him? Because that's what it's coming down to. As persecution comes upon the church, it's going to reveal those who do truly believe and those who do not. Now the third thing that he describes here that will cause you to be counted worthy of God's calling is a work of faith with power. Notice the end of verse 11. He's prayed that God would count you worthy of this calling to fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Now this is the source, the power source of a worthy walk. A walk that is worthy of this calling. This is where you get the power. It's a work of of faith with power. Now, notice here this phrase because it's very important. He's not talking about intellectual faith. He's talking about a real faith. You see, there is a said faith, a profession of faith, 
but it is not real faith. It is, I intellectually know about Jesus, and I intellectually agree that he was a real person, but I have not surrendered my life into his hands. I have not yielded my life to obey him and follow him. And that's not the faith he's talking about here. He's talking about a work of faith. It's not something that you work up. It's something he works in you. Now, he used the same terminology. Turn back with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The same terminology he used in the first chapter. And he uses it here again, not by coincidence. This is a, this is a clearly planned, purposeful choice of words. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, he said, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. So notice he's talking here about this work of faith. This work of faith is something that God does by his power. And it's revealed by the gospel coming into somebody's life, not in word only. They don't just know a bunch of words. They know the reality of a transformed life. And it takes place by this work of faith with power. None of this worthy walk can happen without a real work of faith in your life. Now, do you sense a lack of faith in your life? Do you, do you question whether you have a real work of faith with power? If you do, you know what the solution is? It's pray. Just pray. Prayer is the primary solution to a lack of faith. It says in Jude chapter 1, verse 20, he says, But beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So if you want to build yourself up in faith, you need to pray. Now this can refer to prayer in, with your understanding, and it can refer to prayer in an unknown tongue. It is prayer. When you connect with Him and He connects with you, do you know what happens? You're going to get built up. I mean, just think of when you spend time in prayer with others. The, the strength, the excitement in your own heart that you have, when you leave that time, you are built up. If you are not in a men's prayer group or a women's prayer group in this church, you need to get into one. I'm telling you, they're powerful. They'll change your life. They are very effective. But once he starts that work of faith in you, as you cry out to him, he will perfect it. He will complete it. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says there that we are to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one who is the author. He started our faith. And he's the finisher, the completer. He changes you and matures your faith. It's his job. It's his work. Faith is empowered also by the Holy Spirit. It says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus promised, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the end of the earth. Now this is a powerful promise. And all you have to do is just read the first couple of chapters of Acts to see the reality of how this promise was fulfilled. You see, after Christ was crucified, what did the disciples do? They all ran like scared rabbits, didn't they? They hid out. Peter denied him. Jesus came. He reached out to Peter. He reached out to the other disciples. And even standing in their midst... He still reproved them for their unbelief. 
and their hardness of heart. He then gives them this promise and after his ascension into heaven, you read those first couple of chapters of Acts, were they scared little rabbits anymore? No, not at all. They were bold witnesses for Christ. And it says there, Peter being full of faith, Stephen being full of faith, Philip being full of faith. And you read this statement over and over again. So where do they get the faith? It's the gift of God. He worked that faith in them by the Holy Spirit. And so that is how He will do it in you. As you wait upon Him in prayer, ask Him to fill you with His Spirit. When you are stumbling, when you are struggling, He will strengthen your faith by His Spirit. In Colossians chapter 1, in verses 10 and 11, Notice all of the phrases that are in these two verses are exactly what is referred to in our text here this morning. He says he prays that you would walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to what His glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. So when you need strengthening, where is it going to come from? His might. That's what enables you to do His work. That's what enables you to please Him and to follow Him as you should. Faith is also developed more deeply in your life as you learn the Word of God. So it's the Holy Spirit Prayer, the Word of God. I mean, that's pretty simple. Hang in there. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, he says then, Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. That's where you get it. So be in prayer, be in the Word, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and God will strengthen your faith and cause you to walk after Him. Now, number four, only will you be counted worthy of his calling as his name is glorified in you. Now, that is truly the promise here in verse 12. He says that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him. Now, notice this is the same message as verse 10. Notice, look back there. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints. Now he's praying here, this is how it's going to take place. That he would be glorified in you and you in him. Now this is pretty obvious here from this prayer that if you're not walking in a manner that is pleasing to him, then you will not be glorifying him and you will not be counted worthy of that calling wherewith you are called. It's that simple. Now I think that every single one of us in this room has had the experience of what it means to have contact with someone that makes profession of faith but doesn't live it, doesn't walk it. And I'm telling you that's a sad experience. Some of you in this room, I know, you were actually stumbled and kept from coming to Christ for a long time in your life because you saw someone who was professing their faith in Christ, but they lived a totally different way. I've had people come to me here, you know, em employers, and they say, you know what, I don't even want to hire Christians anymore. Because, you know, they talk a good talk, but they don't work. All they do is just talk, talk, talk. And they aren't working. There's something wrong with that. That is not a good testimony. There's others that have come to me and said, well, but Steve, you know, this person professes that they know the Lord, but, but they're living in immorality. 
I mean, they're living with their boyfriend or their girlfriend. They're smoking pot with the guy down the street. You know, they're out drinking and they come into work with a hangover. You know, there's something wrong with that picture. That does not glorify the Lord. And if it doesn't glorify the Lord, it means you're disobeying Him. And that is the point of this prayer. He's saying, look, if, if you want to be ready for His coming, then you need to pray. And you need to pray that God would fulfill in you that goodness, that life, that change of nature that is enabled by that work of faith with power. Because this is the result, that you might walk worthy of this calling. And He would be glorified as a result. Jesus told His disciples what would glorify Him and how it would take place. He said in Matthew 5.16, He says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I pray that every single one of you are shining and shining your light into the midst of this dark world because it's getting darker. And that only means you're going to shine a little brighter. And if you do, that's going to glorify your Father. People are going to say, what is different about you? There's something different about you. I don't know quite what it is. Can we talk? You say, love to. Take the opportunity and share the Lord. Now, fifth and last, you will only be counted worthy of God's calling by His grace. His grace. Notice that last little phrase there in verse 12. He said, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice again the equality here. We get grace from God the Father and God the Son. They are seen as equal here. This grace is the only thing that brings all of this that I've said to you to pass. It's the only thing that makes it happen. You see, you won't pray unless God has exerted His grace upon you. You are not going to walk worthy of His calling without His grace. You are not going to experience a work of faith with power unless it happens by His grace. You're not going to glorify Him apart from His grace. Grace is where it begins and how it continues and where it will end at His throne, called the throne of grace. He died to give you abundant grace and the gift of righteousness. In Romans 5.17, He said, If by one man's offense death reigned through one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall, will reign in life through one Jesus Christ who receive abundance of grace. Not achieve, but receive abundance of grace. So is this what you hear on your lips when you pray? You should be saying, Lord, grace, I need your grace. Without your grace, I can't do this. I can't live my, my Christian life. I can't walk it unless I have your grace. His grace is what transforms you. It's not according to your merit. It's according to His grace. You cannot achieve it. You cannot work enough for it. Now think about this for a minute because you see, I didn't have anything within me to save myself. It w I was saved by grace. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I am saved by grace through faith and that not of myself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So if I didn't have what it takes to save myself, why should I think that I have what it takes to change myself. I don't have what it takes to change myself. I can't change one thing in my life. 
It has to be changed in me by the power of the Holy Spirit through the grace of God. And when a believer comes to that conclusion, you know what? They stop striving. You know, sometimes Christians say to me, well, Steve, I don't know whether I'm really, you know, depending on God's grace or whether I'm depending on myself or a little bit of both. And I just say, well, look at the fruit. Just look at the fruit. Do you have perpetual failure? That means you're dependent on yourself. Do you have perpetual, unending condemnation because you're failing all the time? That means you're dependent on yourself. You are not being transformed with that work of faith with power. And that's the only way it's going to happen. Will you depend upon Him? If you will, you will be changed. You were saved by grace. You will grow in grace. In 2 Peter 3.18, it says there, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You've got to grow in grace. Grace and works will never be mixed together. They cannot ever be mixed together. Notice what Paul said in Romans 11.6. He said, If by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. He's saying, these two don't go together. They can't go together. They will never go together. It's like oil and water. Shake it up, set it down, and it separates because it cannot be mixed. So if you mix in a little grace and a little work, it's not, it's not going to work real well. You need grace. You need to cry out for grace. Now, when I say this, people say, well, well wait a minute, the Bible talks about you know, doing good works and talks about you know, action that should come forth from your life. Yes, good works and action will come forth from your life if you have received that grace. That's what changes you. That's what makes you a different person. It says in Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21, he says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you, there we go, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. You see, he wants to make you complete in every good work because he wants to work in you to complete that. That is done by grace and by grace alone. There is no way to mix these two. So if you've received the grace, you know what? He'll change your life and he will work through you in a powerful way because he gives you that gift of faith, that measure of faith that he gives to every man, every woman. Again, Romans 12, 3. He said, I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. You see, grace is what gives you that gift of faith, that gift to change you and transform you. So are you, are you trying to achieve change by your own effort or are you allowing him to change you by his grace? His grace is sufficient. It's powerful. It's able if you will just surrender. Then you don't get an attitude. You don't start to think, well, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty together. I am not together, and neither are you. We are in great need. So cry out for grace this morning. Amen?
Let's go to him. Lord, we thank you that you are such a giver. Lord, you love us so. And you want to bestow your grace upon us in such a mighty way. So abundantly, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would do just that. For you that are, are believers here this morning, if you're struggling with your flesh, you're struggling with your anger, your pride, your lust, your addiction, whatever the issue is, will you turn to Him for His grace? We cry out right now. Just say, Lord, I want you to deliver me. I have tried to change this in my life. I can't. But I know you will. Because I'm asking for your grace right now. Cry out. Ask him. He can change anything in anyone. Lord, I just pray that your spirit would do that work this morning. You're mighty. You're powerful, Lord. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you're not a Christian, or you're not sure if you are truly a believer, you probably aren't. I want to encourage you to, to pray with me right now and receive Him. You see, it's grace. If you'll ask for forgiveness, if you'll put your trust in Him and invite Him to come in and take over your life, He'll change you. But you've got to be willing to repent. You've got to be willing to turn and to turn away from your sinful lifestyle and follow Him. If you're ready to do that, then you pray with me right now. Just say, Lord, forgive me. I know I have broken your law. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your grace. Change me. I want to be your disciple. Are you praying that prayer? If you prayed with me just now, I want you to lift your hand here. A simple acknowledgement. Yes, Steve, I prayed before you. Prayed with you. God bless you. Who else? Anyone else? God bless you. Who else? Anyone else here this morning? Lord, we ask that you would just touch these lives, Lord. Touch these hearts. Lord, bring the power of your Holy Spirit to bear in their lives. Lord, let your grace be manifested right now. And Lord, just give that motivation to make those changes, whatever they the need be. And Lord, we believe you're doing that right now. Thank you, Father. We give you praise, Lord, this morning because you are worthy to be praised. Your actions are of the same weight as, Lord, your, your promises. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>